In late October, Courtney Carey, a Dublin-based employee of the Israeli website building company Wix, posted the Gaelic words, and I'm going to butcher them, Saoirse Don Palestine, Freedom for Palestine, on her LinkedIn page. Now, according to new reporting from journalist Lee Fong, within 24 hours of the posting, Carey's message was shared in a WhatsApp group with over 300 people, at least one of whom was a senior Israeli government official. Wix subsequently terminated Carey from her position the following day. Now, in his reporting, Li Fang breaks down the massive alleged effort to shape online discourse about the war in Gaza and silence pro-Palestinian voices. Joining us now to discuss his recent reporting is investigative reporter Li Fang himself. Welcome back, Li. Thanks for having me. All right, walk us through why, in your view, this is so pernicious. This person tweeted a political message on their private page. It got disseminated into this WhatsApp group, and she was subsequently fired. Who is in this group that has that much pull? Well, first, I want to give a big shout out to my co-author, Jack Polson, really fantastic journalist. Um, check out his Substack. Check out Tech Inquiry. It's a watchdog group that he runs. But this, you know, this story is a look into one of the two wars going on. There's the physical war in Gaza, fought by the military, and there's a, a propaganda war, a war to win hearts and minds, and what participants in these groups call the information war, or the second battlefield. Now, uh, of course, there are, there, everyone is, there are many people on both the pro-Palestinian, pro-Israel side, everyone has a right to speak out on these issues. Um, but what's interesting here is that, you know, we're looking at documents, videos, this 300-person WhatsApp group, in addition to kind of the everyday advocacy that you see on any kind of contentious public policy issue, you're seeing a lot of organized attempts to silence the opposition, to cancel events, to uh, block the distribution of certain types of content, to get people censored in various ways. And the participants of this WhatsApp group that we got access to are, are very prominent people. These are Silicon Valley tech executives, venture capital executives, APAC officials, people from the pro-Israel lobbying group, and they are organizing on a daily basis to silence uh, what they see as the opposition. And in this case, one of the participants of this WhatsApp group is a high-level executive at Wix, the, the tech company, the website building company. So when there is a, as, as Robbie mentioned, this, this one employee in Dublin mentioned the term pro-Palestine, or free Palestine, excuse me, uh, on her LinkedIn page, it was immediately screenshotted, shared with a group. Someone said, hey, we're working on it. The person, the executive from Wix said it's been taken care of. We'll look for an announcement. And within 24 hours, they were fired. And, you know, our piece looks at many other similar examples. Right. So this is, uh, would you say this is like the newest manifestation of, um, well, frankly, of cancel culture, of, you know, getting people fired and other um, outcome deplatformed, et cetera, for expressing, um, for expressing political views has been happening more and more over the last several years. The, you know, the ability for people to engage in political speech online in a way that it's, it stays, there's some evidence of it, right? There's, a, there's text, there's emails, there's screenshots, um, has led us to be able to hold people um, more accountable in a way that I, I do think is pretty harmful for society. Yeah, that's right. I mean, this is the latest kind of wave of cancel culture. This is really identity politics on steroids. If you look at the kind of root causes of the Israel-Palestine conflict. And yes, I mean, we've seen over a decade of these kind of organized cancel campaigns, efforts to remove speakers, get student groups ejected from campus. Uh, and in the language, if you look at, there's a lot of form letters, petitions, uh, organized pressure campaigns organized by this WhatsApp group uh, to get speakers removed from events. You know, they, they help contribute to the cancellation of a Rashida Tlaib, a member of Congress from uh, from Michigan, a uh, Palestinian American who was speaking at Arizona State University, contributed to canceling that event. Mohammed El Kurd, a Jerusalem, uh, a, a, a Palestinian writer from Jerusalem, uh, writes for the nation. He was uh, scheduled to speak at the University of Vermont. They helped get that event canceled. And, you know, look at the language in these petitions. They're using that same cancellation language that we've seen in so many other debates on on gender and race and other contentious, emotionally related issues. They, the pro-Israel uh, forces in, in this WhatsApp group say, you know, if, if we allow these pro-Palestinian speakers to appear on campus, that will harm Jewish students, that will 
uh, contribute to a less safe and inclusive environment on these campuses, you know, they use the safetyism language that we've seen really kind of weaponized in so many other debates. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And speaking of other kinds of censorship or cancellation arguments we've been having for years now, there's another interesting correlation between those stories and this one. You write specifically that uh, this pressure is being maintained at the behest of the IDF. So you have this overlap between military and political authority and these social media apps. You write that specifically um, a spokesperson for the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, participated in a Zoom meeting where they specifically call, asked those in the call to, quote, maintain pressure, help with maintaining pressure on legislators and Congress and to work to influence those in, quote, universities or media or think tanks or in elite circles. Can you speak more to the relationship between Israel's actual military and these efforts to censor pro-Palestinian speech in the United States of America? Yeah, I just want to reiterate that, you know, we have freedom of speech, freedom of expression. Every kind of organized interest group has a right to speak out on any of these contentious issues. That's not the issue here. Um, what's unusual here, and I've, I've reported on lots of other, you know, political campaigns and special interest groups, what's unusual here is the heavy involvement of a foreign government. Um, in the WhatsApp group, there's at least one high-level Israeli foreign ministry official that's helping guide the advocacy, providing talking points and other, you know, actually serving on the lobbying and influence task force uh, of this WhatsApp group as they're kind of planning efforts to, to shape the public debate in Congress. Um, but, you know, we this, that's not just the only thing here. You know, we looked at a number of different Zoom calls and webinars that are really guiding the advocacy effort and just a few days after October 7th, you had IDF spokesperson speaking to this uh, tech and VC community and saying, look, you know, we're going to be engaging in this war in Gaza, but we need you uh, to fight in America and not fight a physical war, but to influence elites, to influence Congress, to make sure that Congress continues to, to provide munitions and other forms of military support to Israel so we can win the physical war. And in repeated webinars and other Zoom calls, They've used very similar rhetoric. They, they literally say, for the American supporters, these very influential tech leaders and venture capitalists and others, you are our frontline soldiers. I mean, this, that, actually, that quote is for a student group, but there's very similar similar language uh, in other talks saying, you know, we need you, your help uh, to fight the information war, to fight the second battlefield, to shape what's said, not just on college campuses, but what's said on the entire online space to get people not just canceled and removed, you know, they're, they're raising money even for automated AI-based uh, tech tools to, you know, repeatedly flag accounts from, you know, the perceived opposition um, as anti-Semitic and get them removed. Um, this is a very organized campaign uh, to shape what we talk about in the U.S., how we perceive the conflict, how we per perceive certain journalists, how, how they influence the media. Um, and, and again, the, the role of the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the IDF is very strong here, and that's what makes this uh, particularly unusual. You know, it's interesting because of how popular the narrative was with the media of, for, you know, foreign-based election interference when it was Russia said, uttered over and over again as, as what, what happened in 2016. The reason we got Trump was because of, you know, pervasive Russian interference on social media. And now what you, what you have is we have, you have, we have ac actual examples, some of them uncovered by you and other people doing this work, of Israeli officials or Ukrainian officials or you know, whoever it is um, uh, in, in communication with social media platforms about actual moderation decisions, in, in, in conversation with uh, tech employers about how to handle their employee speech, um, really a, a kind of influencing that, that is far more at the at the top level and and involved than than you know the, the Russian government's like clumsy attempts to have bots on Facebook convince people how to vote or something like that uh, it, it goes well beyond that and uh, but you don't hear you know the media talking about how about that aspect of you know foreign election interference stuff that's right I mean I've looked at and investigated foreign influence efforts from Morocco, from Saudi Arabia, uh, Ukraine, UAE, China. Um, this is a little bit different, perhaps because of the historic bond between the U.S. and Israel, because Israel is a strong U.S. ally. 
Um, but we don't see the same, for whatever reason, we don't see the same level of scrutiny. In fact, this is perhaps much more heavy-handed in terms of influence and, and shaping not just the public debate, but Congress and, and what's what's being said on our university campuses w w in terms of freedom of speech, of academic freedom. Um, the government of, of Israel is playing some role, um, and they're open about some of it. You know, they're, they're sponsoring tons of uh, ads on these platforms. Uh, they, they work with a number of advocacy groups, but the, the media, uh, certainly Congress, does not apply that same level of scrutiny as we've seen towards other foreign governments. All right, you can read more about this on Li Fong's uh, Substack. It's called Inside the Pro-Israel Information War. Thank you so much for joining us to talk about this today, Lee. Thanks for having me.